My first, my first question is about, uh, obviously it's about the, the, the work you have uh, exhibited at NEME, which is Uncertainty in the Loop, and the work is building upon a previous work, which was called uh, The Labor of Making Labor Disappear. And uh, the piece at the time was exploring the possibility of a machine generated exhibition that was based on your own artistic career so far, which meant that the result was a kind of mashup of all your previous works. And this, as you explain yourself, uh, I think it was in your website, but or maybe an interview, but this ex shows really the limits of a machine's ability to forecast the next work of an artist. So how did you, with the, 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 the work you're showing at Neme, how did you build this uncertainty and, and more depth and maybe surprise into the work? Um, how did you do that? Uh, yeah, actually, uncertainty in the loop is the final stage of a two year long project. And uh, the first stage was the labor of making labor disappear. So, as you said, um, I, in this work, converted my labor as an artist. So my works, research and interests of the past 16 years into data and then turned the decision making over to a predictive model that was developed in collaboration with Istok Leber Bayez and Jure Demschar from the Faculty of Computer and Information Science in Ljubljana. So the algorithm use the data set to see through and identify patterns in my artistic practice in order to predict the content and aesthetics of my next work. And as you said, uh, this predictive power is um, definitely limited in its forecast of the future outcome because it gives a selection from among ready-made choices. And even though this might be an original selection, it is still kind of uh, heavily constrained by the decisions or choices that came before. Um, so I wanted to avoid this feedback loop and to break away from the predictive model rolling out combinations of prior existing data. Uh, and in the final stage of the project, I provided the machine a look at my contemporary investigations as a kind of early window into the present disorganization of my thoughts, meaning that my work and research activity over a period of six months was tracked. Uh, tracking and logging was semi-automated, data sorted and analyzed by a custom-made algorithmic sequence we developed additionally. So approximately six uh, months of real-time data uh, was added to the existing uh, parameters and every word from every text that passed in front of my eyes uh, increased the data set, opening new horizons of thought. And this uh, present rendition, where I am now, or uh, more specifically, where I was at that particular moment without really having made any active decisions um, in regards to what I want to do next, is connected with the existing data set over multiple layers. So there's this huge amount of technical, descriptive, sociological terms that are ranked not only by the frequency of their occurrence, but also how they interconnect with the existing data set. And then the algorithm determines tomorrow's artwork based on the observations today uh, with the past flickering in the rear view mirror. So. Okay. Um, yeah, so now I'm wondering, um, were you surprised by the work of the, this, this algorithm? Uh, did it teach you something about your own career you didn't know about? I mean, did this uh, algorithmic work manage to, to surprise you? I mean, there were many elements that were surprising. One of them is definitely um, Despite expecting it, uh, what uh, the amount of work required for the attempt to automate a part of my work process. Um, I mean, it's compelling to observe the revealed patterns in uh, one's artistic practice. 
So what has over time become increasingly important to me and what was abandoned. But I think um, it's strange, you know, when you have to deal with the kind of aftermath of the quantified self. Um, and, you know, what does it mean to try and distance yourself from your subjectivity uh, while consciously choosing to delegate your decisions to a computer program? Um, and this um, submission, in my case, it's important to emphasize, was a voluntary one. Um, but I think the probability that a predictive model that is based on my working methods and my interest would lead me to alienated labor is almost non-existent. I think that alienation, alienation happens um, during the process of its very making, you know, when you're converting your works into data um, and data preparation and entry, data categorization, evaluated parameters, where you're constantly also facing self-evaluation, um, at the end of that process, your work appears again as something completely foreign in a way. So that was, um, I think, a surprising element that was actually quite hard to deal with. But I guess what surprised me the most was working on Pataka. Um, I can honestly say that I would have never made a work about machines listening to our voices if it weren't for the algorithm. So based on its prediction, and the parameters that were underlined with high confidence level and high value as being crucial for my next artwork. I started researching how the state of your mental health leaves a fingerprint in your speech production and voice with a particular focus on depression. So I think, yeah, this, um, I, I guess, was the goal um, of the project, but it was still nonetheless um, a surprising direction. No. Thanks. I have um I mean I have a more general question. Um the work of uh, artists is often presented as being the most resistant to automation because it's something special and creative. And more and more we see stories in the news about how AI or machines or algorithms, whatever you, you want to call it, how they are composing music, how there is even this AI who painted a, a Rembrandt, or even the work that I do, which is uh, writing as an art critic, even that can be automated. So while working on these projects, and, and in general, I mean, uh, in the conversation or in whatever you, you read or encounter, did you learn something about the, the possibility of machines taking, taking, stealing the job of artists and being more creative than, than them? Is it a fear, a concern that you have? So what's, what's your take on that? I think uh, um, the question of creativity raises a lot of interesting issues. And one of them, uh, if uh, I remember like what uh, this um, guy called Daniel Suskind said, one of them is if we value products of machine creativity in the way we value products of human creativity. Because let's say that a machine behaves in an original or novel way, uh, we might still not value its output because we tend to prefer the creativity of human beings and this um, particularly rings true in the artistic setting because, you know, I read about this algorithm uh, that was supposed to minimize the differences between its answers and the correct answers. And what the algorithm did was it found where the correct answers were stored and deleted them so it would get a perfect score. <laughs> and for me, you know, that's like the goal is achieved, but the way it was done was surprising, it was unexpected, and I find its act of subversion kind of almost like an act of sabotage as actually really inspiring, you know. Um, and um, I think for me, machine creativity, I think, is at its strongest when it's 
when its inner workings are not familiar, when it's um, something strange. You can think about like this increasingly capable non-thinking machine as having its own life in a way. It's kind of like own characteristics that are for me the most interesting when you can recognize in them something inherently other. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I mean, I worked together and collaborated with the machine by using it as a kind of partner and a tool but its probabilistic report still requires also my involvement, my input and in interpretation. Um, but I guess in, um, what I also kind of want to say maybe just more generally is that we also think about, when we talk about the future of work, we think about, you know, jobs as indivisible, like, as monolithic and um, but within like a certain job, you can find you will find that people perform a wide range of tasks and activities. So sometimes we make a mistake um, also because we assume that the way technological change affects work is by displacing entire jobs in an instance. Um, but according to Suskind, this um, change actually happens in a way that is far more gradual. So it might take us more effort to find a job that can be fully automated, but almost all jobs uh, have a large component that can be, um, according to him, um, and I, I agree with that. But uh, in regards to creativity and Rembrandt, um, John Manick wrote this um, interesting essay about um, machines um, and creativity and AI. And he said, if machines are, you know, strictly deterministic, if they can um, never be more than the sum of its parts, then it's easy to deny them creative agency. But um, he also asks if a machine can kind of operate along non-deterministic lines, you know, if it can be more than the sum of its parts, can it be creative? Um, he mentions, um, and this, uh, I also agree with that, you know, if a computer kind of produces a painting in the style of Rembrandt, it can do so because Rembrandt created um, a template for that emulation. But for him, the answer in regards to creativity is not, let's say, in randomness, but in learning. So if a system can learn, then it's no longer deterministic. It's, you know, adaptive, it's complex, and uh, for him it can be creative. So maybe I will conclude with that.